worship with us this morning. Sing this and say, Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Gonna walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the dark Every crown no longer 
where there is a difference, in his presence where there's freedom, it's in his presence where there is a change. And truly, there is no other name worthy to be praised. There is no other name worthy to be praised. Amen. There is
Jesus Christ, my Lord, for he's the great
But we, we, we dealt with uh, Jesus being a game changer. We talked about the adulterous woman. And I, and I showed you how Jesus came and brought her life. You know, he changed that. He was a game changer in her life. And then last week we talked about the demon possessed man, the legion, how Jesus had enough power to cast a legion of demons out of one man. In other words, there, was, there weren't enough demons to stop Jesus from doing what he was going to do. So again, you can tell us the power of Jesus. And today, we're going to have Jesus taking power over something else, which the enemy a lot of times seems he has control of, but we read about in Revelation chapter 1, how when Jesus, when he died and resurrected, when he, he went to hell, he literally wrestled away the keys of death and hell. So, so, so now all of that rests in his power. And Jesus was even showing it, he's going to get show it now, where he has power over all things. Nothing is done until Jesus says it is done. So today we're going to be dealing with the grieving mother. In Luke chapter 7, verses 11, 12, this is when we're introduced to this account. And it says, Soon afterwards, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain. And a large crowd followed him. Verse 12, a funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. So the, the, there's a couple things before I go any further. There's a couple things I'm going to talk to you about. Number one, there were two vastly different crowds. There were two vastly different crowds. Jesus and his crowd were heading into the city as another crowd we read it was coming from their, their city on the way out. Jesus is being followed by his 12 disciples and also by other people as well. Jesus had just given them some inspired teaching and then Jesus, he also heals the servant of a centurion without even seeing or touching that servant. Oh, he healed this guy when, when you know when, when the Jewish people came to him, the Jewish people said, "Hey, you know, th th this Roman soldier, he's worthy for you to do something for him because you know, he's been good to us, been good to the Jewish nation. He built a synagogue." He says, "He says, okay, I'll go and heal this guy." Before he even got there, the centurion says, "Jesus, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed." And literally, Jesus, he would, he would, he was amazed at this man's faith. He says, "I haven't seen such great a faith in Israel." He says, "Your servant's healed." And he left the shore enough. The servant was healed. So everybody was buzzing and excited about this fact that Jesus did it. So they were all so they were all still talking about and celebrating what Jesus, what he was teaching, what he was doing. And so this crowd uh, around Jesus is buzzing with excitement and anticipation of what Jesus is going to do next. Then at the city gate, they run into a different crowd. Remember, Jesus' crowd is that they're, they're, they're excited about what is going on. This crowd is probably just as noisy as the crowd that's with Jesus, but this crowd is not joyous. This crowd is not celebrating. This crowd is mourning. There were people who were crying and sobbing because this was a funeral procession. So like I said, so there are two vastly different crowds that, that met on this road near this town of Nain. In this crowd, there was a mother. There was a mother in this crowd. This mother may have even been leading her crowd because it was her one and only son who died. And honestly, there's nothing I could think, nothing worse I could think of in life than having to bury a child. I, I, I can't think of any worse thing I would ever face in my life than having to bury a child. And understand this, that was, God did not design our world to originally be that way. Because Adam and Eve were designed what? In a perfect world. In a world without death, without sorrow, without pain. But sin brought all of this to play. And again, you know, you've heard us requesting prayer for this little girl, this four-year-old named Brenna. Brenna's going through what she's going through, not to any fault of her own, but she's going through what she's going through simply because we live in a fallen world. You know, she just happened to be one of the ones who, unfortunately, the fall affected her in this way. But how many of you all know God is still in control? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to show you this this morning. Because, again, we dealt with the woman caught in the act of adultery. We dealt with the man who was, um, was demon-possessed. And just look what we're going to do. Just wait for what we're going to deal with today. 
this crowd was headed, this crowd with his mother, they were headed out to the cemetery. And actually, to make things even worse for this mother, we are also told that she was a widow. I don't know if you know this, but the way that families survived back in those days, back in biblical times, was through the work of the men. Um, women could do things like around the house and around the home, but it was the men who provided the income and provided the necessities for, to live on. This son most likely had been supporting his mother. Why? Because again, he says she was a widow, so we know her husband had died. So this son more than likely was her main means of survival and hope for the future. Because she was not allowed to inherit land, the loss of her only son would have left her dependent upon the charity of distant relatives or neighbors. Others, she would have been at, at the mercy of the charity of others around her. With her husband gone and now her only son gone, she would be in a very, very difficult place. And I believe Luke mentions this situation of this woman to let us know the weight that she was feeling and the weight that the crowd with her was feeling when they were going to the cemetery in this procession. This mother was probably facing the worst thing a parent can face. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus came to make a difference and to turn her life and to turn the situation around. So we have two different vast, we have two vastly different crowds. We are introduced to this mother who is in a very desperate situation. But also, I'm sure there was a very, there was an awkward meeting. Jesus and his crowd, I'm sure they noticed the funeral procession coming as they were probably reverently just sort of stepping back as they noticed what was going on. I don't know uh, if it, would, it was more awkward for Jesus' crowd or the other crowd. You know, because uh, would Jesus' crowd have been embarrassed for having been laughing and joking and celebrating while this other crowd was crying and weeping and welling? Or would the other crowd um, have, been, have, been, have been embarrassed or, or more disturbed but by hearing this joyous crowd going on when they're, when they're crying and welling? It truly was a very awkward Situation. So I don't know who it was more awkward for. For the ones coming into the city or for the ones going out. All I know is they were two vastly different crowds. And they were, and they, they were reacting in two different, completely different ways. So, they're, so, when, so when they begin to get close to each other or pass by each other, how many of you know there had to be a very awkward meeting? But not only that, I'm getting ready to introduce to you the fact that there was an impossible statement that was made. Jesus is getting ready to tell this mother what, what truly I believe to be an impossible statement. In verse, chap, in verse 13 in chapter 7 it says, When the Lord saw her, his heart was overwhelmed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. The next thing that happens is that Jesus makes an impossible statement. He says, don't cry. I'm still trying to figure out a little how this thing played out. Did Jesus say this right away as soon as he saw the mother? Did he, did he uh, speak it before all the awkwardness of the crowd walking through each other? What was, maybe, was Jesus trying to, to stay away and just sort of hang back, but then all of a sudden when he saw this mom, he was moved with such compassion that he just had to intervene, that he calls out to her to stop crying. I don't know exactly when Jesus reached out to this mother, but I do know he was touched. His heart was touched by her situation. And he felt compassion for this mother. And he reaches out to her and he says, don't cry. But then you sort of have to, to look at this. Here's, the next, here, here's a question we have to ask ourselves. I wonder how this mom responded. I wonder how this mom reacted. Did she ignore him? 
did she get furious? He told her not to cry. It was bad enough that she has lost her husband. Now she has lost her only son, her only way of support. And now all of a sudden this person that she has never met says, don't cry. Crying was probably the only thing that she could do considering her situation. Welling was probably the only thing she could do because, again, overwhelmed with the loss of her husband and now her son and then now her, her situation that, that's there that she's confronted with, she's going to have to deal with for the rest of her life. Crying probably was the only thing this woman can do. So, we have two vastly different crowds. We have a mother. We have an awkward meeting. And then we have the utterance of an impossible statement. But Jesus doesn't seem to wait for her to respond to his statement. Because it says in verse 14, it says that then he walked over to the cough and he touched it. The bear stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Now, man, now many things would have been happening at this moment. First, Jewish people were forbidden. They were forbidden to touch dead things. It was against the law of Moses for a Jew to touch dead. A dead animal, a dead body. In fact, is once they touched it, they were unclean for a certain amount of time. So, so, so this action would have meant that Jesus would have been unclean. And so, so people didn't go around touching dead things. They didn't go around touching coffins. And besides that, I can even feel, you can probably even sense and feel the tensions rising after he, he tells the mother to stop crying, and then all of a sudden he walks over to the casket and he says, Get up. Huh. Talk talk about huh. talk about huh. what this this other crowd was, was dealing with, because mother Mourning mothers just don't stop crying. And how many of all know dead people just don't get up? <laughs> Do that. But, but we're not just talking about anyone saying, don't cry. And we're not talking about anyone who just said, get up. Right. Are we? We're just not talking about some Joe Schmo. We're talking about the one and only Son of God, the one who we talked about with the adulterous woman, or the one who we talked about, the man who was, who was possessed with the demon, the one who came and met Saul on the road to Damascus, on the one who was, who was, who was present in many things, and we're going to cover some more things as we go through this series. We're talking about the one who did some amazing things. But yet he, he's sitting there saying, he says, he says um, young man, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. You know, I sort of wonder, you know, we have no idea. I sort of wonder what in the world he began to say. I wonder if, I wonder if one of these things he said says, what's going on? What are y'all crying for? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Because, because well, it could be that too. Some of them could have been acting like Fred Sanford. Elizabeth, I'm coming ready to join you, honey. I'm coming, Elizabeth. How many of y'all remember him doing that? All I know is, if I would have been there, and I was part of this probably mother's crowd, um, I may have lost control of things. I mean, I, honestly, I don't, I don't know. See, see, we can simply say, "Well, I know how," but the thing is, you got to remember. This is when Jesus is first walking this earth. People are seeing him start to do miracles. So not everyone knows, you know, we, we here today, because we've been in church any, we've been in church for a while, we would not necessarily be surprised to see Jesus go into a funeral and go, get up. And a person what? What? That wouldn't surprise us. 
But imagine, imagine not really knowing who he is or not knowing who he is, having this dude come in and do this, and all of a sudden someone sits up. I'm telling you, you're going to freak out. Yeah. I wouldn't accept it. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. you, be, you be doing this. Yeah. <laughs> am I nuts? Am I, am I saying what, what you, you, you know what I'm saying? Did this, this, this crowd, yeah. <laughs> then the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. And how do we know this crowd was sort of freaking out? Great fear swept the crowd. In other words, I'm sure it was good fear, and I'm also sure it was bad fear at the same time. I'm telling you, these people were freaking out. And then what and they praised God, saying, Now all of a sudden they begin to realize what's going on. A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. So what was the result? This dead boy got up out of the grave. He, not out of the grave. He got up out of this coffin and was given back to his mom. All of a sudden, this mother, her, 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 her sadness was turned to joy. See, you understand, that more than likely, the coffin he was going there in isn't coffins like we think of today. It more than likely was an open-top coffin because... Many times, they didn't necessarily bury in, this, in these areas people in the ground. They buried them a lot of times in, in caves. So they were going to take him in and put his body inside of a, a cave. So, 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 you know, so that's one reason why you know, the, the, the young boy could probably, or the young man could probably sit up a little easier, is because he was um, in, a, in an open coffin. Now, the only question is, it doesn't tell us. Well, we know, I'm pretty sure he probably wasn't wrapped with grave clothes yet, because I think they probably do all that, that preparation at the, at the grave site. Hence why when Lazarus was raised from the dead, you know, they removed the stone. He was already in, he was already in a tomb, and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. They removed the, the grave clothes off him because Lazarus come out, you know, wobbling like a mummy. So, but here we, we see, we, again, you know, we see this happening. I have down here, game changer. What a game changer. For this mother, there was probably not another day in her life that compared with this day. You think? The problem, you know, I mean, think about it. She, it was the day her son's funeral was to take place, but Jesus canceled it, and instead they celebrated new life. Other words, you know, Jesus brought these two crowds who were going in different directions and joined them together. They were actually, they initially started off doing two different things. Celebr one was celebrating rejoicing, so guess what? Even the awkwardness of the meeting, the ones who were, were mourning and weeping, the awkwardness of their meeting began to subside, and all of a sudden they begin to now go in the same direction. They went back into the city because there was no use going to the cemetery because the dude that was in the coffin is not in there anymore. They don't need to go out there and well and cry or anything else. They can now turn around and they now join the joyous crowd that is with Jesus and they joyously go through to the city of Nain celebrating what Jesus has done. Because what they declared that a great prophet is now among us. God has sent a great prophet, but someone much more than a prophet showed up that day. Someone so much more than a prophet showed up that day. And I pray that if you're here today struggling, I pray that you will look to Jesus in your situation and know that Jesus is the game changer. Now, I wish I could guarantee that Jesus will work a miracle like this in your life as he did with this woman when, when, when she raised her son from the dead. But I can't guarantee he's going to do that same exact work for you. But I do know I do know this, that Jesus will not hesitate to meet you where you are. That is just his nature. Jesus will not hesitate to have compassion on you. And I'll show you how I know this. In, in, I'm working, we're going to look at three different verses in Matthew. Matthew 9, 36. When he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he, he had compassion on them.
because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So immediately, as soon as he saw the crowd, and he saw that, that they were like people without a shepherd, oh, they were people who were in need, what did he do? He had compassion on them. Matthew 14, 14. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So again, Jesus, he, had, he, had a, he has a heart for hurting people. Matthew 20, 34. Jesus felt sorry for them and touched their eyes. Instantly they could see, then they followed him. Here, just by what reading here, we understand that more like what it was. It was blind people who were around him. They were asking for Jesus to heal them. They heard about this one named Jesus. And what did he do? He had compassion on them and healed them. So understand, Jesus will not hesitate to meet you where you are. And also understand this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 tells us this. Give all your worries and cares to God. Now let me stop there a second. How many of your worries and cares? All. all. What does all include? Everything. Nothing left out. Give all your cares and worries to God. For He cares about you. That's why Jesus came. Because He cares about His creation. I want you to understand that when Jesus saw the broken heart of this mother, He was moved with compassion to change her situation. And understand this. It's okay to be discouraged frustrated, irritated with your situation. But never think that you are alone. Never think you're going through this alone, especially if you are a child of God. That's what I'm saying. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I can't fathom how I would get through certain things in life if it wasn't for Jesus. I don't know how sinners get through certain situations that they do without Jesus. Without him being there to be that 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 that, that, that covering of God, because again, this is what Jesus said in Matthew twenty-eight, verse twenty, the last part of that verse. He says, "Be sure of this: I am with you always, even to the end of the age." He says, "I'll never leave you, leave you, nor forsake you." That's a promise that Jesus gives to his his followers that he will never leave us nor forsake us. What a promise he is giving us. But I, but I want you to know today, know today, that there is a game changer. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Whatever your need today, just call out to that name, which is above all of the names. There is no other name worthy to be praised. There is no other name worthy to be praised. Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the great Emmanuel. There is no other name worthy to be praised. Your name, O oh Lord, is the tower into which we run. In times of distress, you give us power to make us overcome. And it's by your name. You know, what am I doing? I'm speaking to you. It's hard to do something. A lot of times I can only do it when I sing the song. It's by your name. The name of the Lord. What is that name? That name is Jesus. That name is Jesus. There is no other name like the name of Jesus. The same as when Jesus came in contact with a woman called the act of adultery. He gave her, he gave her salvation. He offered her salvation and a new life. He gave her a declaration where she didn't have to continue in that life anymore. And he ended up giving the same thing to, to the man who was, who was possessed with a demon, with, with thousands of demons living inside of him. They didn't have enough power to stop him. He set him free. And, says, and this guy was, was thankful so much to Jesus that he wanted to go with him. And Jesus says, no. He says, you go tell everybody the goodness, how God, how good God has been with you. Hence, I will sing of the goodness of God. And this man went about around the ten cities around him again to declare what Jesus did for him. And he said, the people were amazed. And we read a little right later on when Jesus came back to that seashore, not necessarily back to the same, same town, but when he came back, they recognized who, his, who he was. And also they brought everybody they knew that was sick to him. And they said, if they, if they could just at least touch 
that the fringe of his robe they beheld. And it said, everyone, everyone who touched him was made whole. He made a difference. And then when Jesus, he already performed a great miracle by not even touching a guy, just sending the word. And the servant was healed. And yet when he saw the grieving mother and his crowd welling with her, he was moved with compassion. And he, he turned that mother's mourning. How much you would bet she went from mourning into dancing. You turned my mourning into dancing again. You lifted my sorrow. Yes, I yes. can't stay silent. I will sing for your joyful. What? Oh, oh, oh. Joy, joyful goodness or whatever it is. Like, joy is, what, is joy has come. Has come? Yeah, I can't, we're going back 30 years ago with that song. Okay? But again, he, he turns our mourning into dancing if you allow him to. Jesus, he is the game changer. When Jesus is present, it is a game changer. He changes everything about your life. But I'm going to put this caveat in it. If you allow him to. Now again, you were saying, well, well, pastor, did this mother ask for her son to be raised? No. I guarantee you she didn't. Because again, she probably didn't even know who Jesus was. She might have been hearing stuff about in the fringes about this guy walking around Judea doing some stuff. But I guarantee it got her attention when, when he went over there and said, don't cry. Like I said, we sort of wonder how she responded. We don't know. But he didn't, he didn't wait for a response because he had compassion upon her. Because in his mind he said, you know what? I can take care of this lady's situation. And he gave her her son back. Like I said, and all of a sudden, I guarantee you, I don't know if she may have fainted first um, or, or her jaw, um, jaw dropped to the ground. I, I don't know. All I know is, like I said, the people were freaking out. But it turned into joy. And they walked back into the city praising God because what would, he, again, he turned their mourning into dancing. Why, why was he able to do this? Because he is the game changer. When you experience Jesus as a game changer, there is nothing you won't do. There is no place you won't go. There is nothing you won't proclaim to bring honor and glory to God. Because he has so radically changed your life. Again, I want, to, I want you to understand this. Nothing is over until God says it's over. God has the final say in all things. And he is the game changer and the story rewriter. Maybe, maybe you think, maybe, maybe um, symbolically your life may be dead or you, you think your career's dead or whatever. I'm here to tell you he can bring life to whatever that is because he is the game changer. You just have to pour out your heart before him. Even though this woman wasn't pouring out her heart before Jesus, I'm assuming on the way there, she was probably in her understanding of, 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 the, of, the, of, of, of God because, you know, they, they were Jews. I'm sure she was pouring out her heart before God, mourning before God. So in a way, you know, she, was, she knew that God was her only hope. And the father allowed his son to become in that way when she was going the other way. And, and, and literally brought a difference to her life and changed her life. And I'm here to tell you, we need to understand that Jesus is able to resurrect things about our life. He is the game changer. Because of that, we, again, we need to have the attitude that Paul had when he wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. This, we open every service with this. So far as we've been going through the series, and we've closed every service pretty much with this in this series. We have to get to a place that we want him more than anything. There's a mindset that we must get to. As our musicians get in place, let's read this portion of Scripture. Yes, everything else is worthless. We compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. 
For his sake, we have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that we could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. And since Jesus has been a game changer in your life, if you're a believer here this morning, Jesus has been a game changer in your life. And since he's been a game changer in your life, you should desire for him to be a game changer in other lives people's lives too. So again, I, I hope, I hope that this has been encouraging to you today that Jesus, again, when Jesus shows up, when Jesus when we humble ourselves and allow him to display his power he is a game changer. But we have to get but we need to get to a place where the Lord I want you more than anything else. And when we reach it, we'll find, again, I'm not saying, I will never tell you life's going to be easy. But it'll be easier to handle because you made a determination in your mind that no matter what, you're not giving up on him because you know he will never leave you nor forsake you and that he cannot fail. And your life and your future is in his hands hands. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with us this morning. And we're going to end our time together declaring that Jesus is the way maker. And I do want to declare to you today that He is here. He is moving in our midst. He is working in this place. He's here to touch every heart. He's here to heal every heart. He's here to turn lights around. He's here to mend every heart. He is the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. He's the light of the darkness. He's my God, and I pray He's your God. Amen? That is who He is. Even when we don't see it, He's working. Even when we don't feel it, He's working. He never stops. He never stops working. Why? Because he is the way maker. Amen. So let's sing to him this morning. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. Yes, I worship you. You are here. Working in this place, I worship you. Say, I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. Yes, I worship you. You are here. I worship you. Why? For you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. For you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God. Worship. 